No, it was October 3rd, 2009. Uh, we were stationed at a little outpost called Combat Outpost Keating. We'd been there about three months. Um, and prior to even getting there, we'd kind of heard the briefs and, and got the reports and the death by PowerPoint presentations of where we were going. And this outpost sat at the bottom of a valley surrounded by mountains on, on every side. Um, and my platoon was fortunate enough uh, one of my team leaders, Sergeant Kirk, had just served, uh, just came back from Afghanistan less than a, a year before this, uh, and he was there in that, that area. So to have that first-hand account from Sergeant Kirk letting us know what we're really about to get into, because it wasn't until the first day uh, I'd arrived to the outpost and got off the Chinook, and it was dark. Tried to look around some, but you know you can't see too much in IRs. You can't really grasp the, the perception of it. Um, it was that next morning when the, the sun came up and went outside and looked around and you're just looking straight up the mountains all around you and you're thinking to yourself, well, what the, what are we doing here? This is kind of a ridiculous spot. Uh, but it was really inspiring to see, though, the, uh, my guys that day, uh, my platoon that, that understood that we got put in a pretty crappy situation, but that wasn't going to deter them from just being great soldiers. So when the firefight kicked off, it just after six that morning, I was still in, still in the rack. I'd just gotten off uh, guard duty a few hours before, so I was catching up on sleep. And we got hit on pretty much a constant basis for the first three months there. But that morning when the rounds came in and woke up, you just knew that this was something different. This was a little bit more. Um, jumped out of bed, threw my kit on, kicked my radio on, and I could start hearing the reports from our uh, perimeter security, our defensive positions. And every report coming in was taking overwhelming fire in every direction. So my job was initially was trying to uh, get an assessment of what we were actually facing, get an accountability on uh, my platoon mates. My team leader, Sergeant Gallegos, was at one of the, the far perimeter defenses. Um, and he started calling in requests for indirect fires, mortar fires, uh, whatever he could get in close air support. Uh, so I continued to try and figure out what direction we needed to kind of push. I was trying to get a few of the guys to, to, to rally up for uh, whatever our next move was. Uh, but I knew Sergeant Gallegos and uh, the, the guys out there, Mace and Sergeant Larson and Carter and and uh, Sergeant Martin were uh, isolated and trapped in a pretty bad way. Shortly thereafter, Hart came across the radio and said they got an RPG pointed right at me. And that was the last transmission we heard from Hart. Um, somehow, Faulkner was able to make it back all the way from there. He was pretty badly wounded, but he really couldn't give us too many details of what happened. At that point, I went in there to kind of get the assessment from my platoon leader, Lieutenant Bunderman, who this entire time had finally started getting some of the close air support on station. And After Hart's transmission, we knew the enemy was overrunning the position, and we were scared. They were taking equipment and radios, so made the decision to flip fre frequencies so they couldn't hear us trying to coordinate uh, for our next move. Came up with the plan with Lieutenant Bunderman. Told him, look, we're going we're gonna to assault up. We're going to take the ammo supply point back because Copus is about out of ammo. He's the only gun left. We're all out, almost out of ammo, uh, so we need to get the ammo to keep in this fight. I went back into the barracks. I had a group of guys in there. Um, like I said, that was basically the, the final fallback position, the last stronghold we really had. <clears throat> I walked, <clears throat> walked into the barracks, and I just asked, hey, I need volunteers. And one of the, the greatest things I've ever seen in my life 
proudest moment as a leader is I had five guys stand up without hesitation. Sergeant Rasmussen, Delaney, Danley, Jones, and Sergeant Miller without hesitation said, hey, we'll follow you, let's go. I told him, hey, well, we're going to take this bitch back. Here's the plan. And in hindsight, when I look at it, I, I don't know if I could have had that courage that those men did. I don't know if someone running into a barracks with kind of a harebrained idea, if I'd have the stones to, to follow them. But to see those five guys do that, I just can't even describe it. So we pushed out made our first launch and we made it up to the ammo supply point. Got in there and started flushing ammo back to the rest of the, the rest of the element. Started taking fire again and Jones on the machine gun, keeping their heads down to the north. Delaney handling business inside the cop. I had enemies still floating through the, the maintenance bay area and the, uh, the mortar position. While well, we were sitting there at that position, we had Taliban fighters come up and snuck up against the wall where Jones was firing down the river. I was able to get up on him, and Danley was sitting there with local security. And the guy came around and hit Danley in the, the arm. Danley went down, and Raz ended up taking care of him, uh, taking care of the Taliban fighter. I threw a dressing on Danley real quick. and kind of pointed him back in the direction of the aid station, the Alamo position. I said, hey, you gotta, you gotta make it back. I left Jones there on security. They sent out another guy, uh, Sergeant Scholes. So I teamed them up there on the corner to kind of support our backside. And uh, Sergeant Miller, Raz, Delaney and myself made the push around the corner, went into the Shura building, cleared that. I was able to capture a couple of uh, the enemy machine guns coming in there. We were able to shut the front gate at that point. At this, you know, I don't know if it was two hours or ten minutes between that, but uh, we were pretty sure that everybody up at Gallegos' position had been taken out. Shortly after getting into the Shura building, Lieutenant Bunnerman calls me across the radio and says, hey, Bro, you won't believe this, but uh, Larson Carter still alive. Mace is still alive, but he's badly wounded. Um, if you can set support by fire, we'll bring in an airstrike, cover their move. Uh, they're going to pick up Mace and bring him back. Told me, yeah, we can do that. We launched out, set the support by fire in, had the close air support come in and really do a number. Larson and Carter grabbing Mace, came peeling by us, brought him back to the aid station. We kind of folded back into a little more secure perimeter uh, inside the Shura. And a little bit later, Sergeant Larson calls me up on the radio and says, hey brother, got checked out by the medics, I'm good to go, where are you at? I'm coming to you now. I told them we're out by the front gate. If you can make it here, we, we could sure use another hand. Um, called back, he's like, well, do you need anything on the way? Can I bring you anything out? I said, well, yeah. Bring uh, Dr. Pepper and Camel Lights. <laughs> Short while later comes Sergeant Larson, carton of camels and a 12-pack of Dr. Pepper and, and the chaos, everything going on. We kind of took a tactical pause, a little time out, cracked open a, a warm Dr. Pepper and sat there and drank it. Smoked my first cigarette of the day, got done, and Larson kind of gave us the brief that I was pretty sure Gallegos was down. He didn't know where Martin went. Griffin was just outside the Shura building. So uh, we got the word to, to launch out, um, push forward to try and recover our fallen. We make our first bound come up and we find Martin. Casualty collection team comes out, hand him off and they bring him back, push up on our next bound, come across Gallegos, um, 
able to push him back, but at this point, Blue Platoon still wasn't able with what they were in to, to set that flank on us. Uh, so we realized we got a little overcommitted and we couldn't continue to, to push. We were just going to be too exposed. So we bounded back and at that point the, the order was to, to hold what we got. QRF was landed up at Ogie Fritchie and they were already making their, their move down to the mountain to, to reinforce and support us. Uh, so just as dark was following, it was getting dark out. QRF was just coming off the mountain. Made link up with them. They started pushing and sweeping through camp. We started handing over our defensive positions with them and kind of reorganizing. A little while later, the QRF had called us up and said they'd found heart. And it was almost 12, 13 hours later before we finally had accountability of, of all the eight fallen soldiers that day. Receiving the medal has been kind of one of those experiences that, I mean, there's eight other guys that I serve with that deserve it. Um, but I realize that just because I was selected to wear it, I know it's, it's not for me at all. It's for not just those eight, but, but every soldier that has ever served. The soldiers that are still serving now are overseas, still in the fight. And it's for those soldiers of our future wars. You know, this is their medal. Uh, I've just been selected to wear it.